There is an ancient book that remains a mystery to most of the Earth's inhabitants. It tells us why we are here, reveals the mysteries of heaven and the horrors of hell, and the hero is God himself in our Lord Jesus Christ. Learn of the Ancient of Days by listening to Bible Believers Fellowship Saturdays at noon and Sundays at 9.30 p.m. on 91.5 Freedom. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and part one of our two-part study in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. The message is titled, Jesus the Stone. Mark chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. This is part one of two. That's the website, bbfohio.com. And then in April, we're hoping to get the other one back, and we'll just have both going to the same website. Uh, starting to pick up again. People are getting word, and the, the visits and everything to the website are picking up. Mariah's done a lot of good work on that. And uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12, if you want to turn your Bibles, this week's study. Mark chapter 12, we've gone through the book of Mark, verse by verse. There are about 70 Bible studies so far uh, in our study of the book of Mark, and we still have about uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, four chapters to go. Uh, and we're in Mark chapter 13 beginning next week. But before we dive into Mark 13, I uh, wanted to go back to verses 10 and 11 in Mark chapter 12 because understanding that Jesus is the stone is something that will benefit you as you read from Genesis to Revelation. And you're supposed to be reading from Genesis to Revelation. Did you know that? God gave us 66 books and Jesus said that it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that is Genesis to Revelation. Now, if you will read three chapters a day, you'll go through it once a year. And as you do that, you come to church regular and get into these Bible studies. I will guarantee you a money-back guarantee... No, I'm not going to bring money into it. <laughs> but I will guarantee you that this time next year, you will be changed. If you'll just read three chapters a day and come regular to these Bible studies, one year from now, you'll be changed. Not only because of the crazy people you'll be hanging around with, because that will influence you, but because the constant and consistent intaking of the bread of life, the word of life, it changes you. Now, one of the things you'll get at these Bible studies, you'll pick up things and they'll get planted, and then as you read through the Bible, you'll remember those things, and it'll help you as you read through the Bible. In Mark chapter 10, verses 10 11, it says this. Read it with me. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, when you read the Bible, one of the first things you want to do is ask God to help you. And we're going to do that right now. If you'd bow your head and close your eyes and pray with me. Father, we thank You, Lord, for this book. We thank You for Your Holy Spirit, the Counselor. And we thank You for this opportunity to study. And we ask that Your Holy Spirit would guide us and help us to learn. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 That's how simple it is. You do not have to pray in big, long words, you don't have to say, Dear God, we thank Thee for this bounty that You have given us. And blah, 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 blah. Just talk to the Lord like you'd talk to anyone you respect. That's it. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says, if you lack wisdom, ask and He will give it. And He has given it. And I've seen it over and over through my life. He gives it from the book. And it, the Bible says here, He's asking a question. Have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Now, 
most of us really don't know what he's talking about there. And if you're a uh, building or a builder, a mason by trade, you know that when you build a building, there has to be a cornerstone. And everything is built upon that cornerstone. Well, the stone here was rejected and has become the head of the corner. And that's a strange thing that we're, we don't have time to get into all that, but we're going to in the future study. But we want to emphasize this reference to the stone. And it says, this was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. He said, haven't you read that? And sadly, a lot of Christians, as they read the Bible, they've read it, but they haven't read it. They've seen it with their eyes, but they haven't really gotten it. What's it talking about? The stone. Jesus is the stone. We had the theme in the music this morning. The solid rock, the stone, the chief cornerstone, as Jenny sang. That's, that's a reference directly to Jesus. And what you just read in Mark is a quotation of Psalm 118, uh, verses 22 and 23. And I want to see that context. Go ahead and turn there. Psalm 118 in your Bible. Psalm 118. And this is another key to successful Bible study. It's Scripture with Scripture. And as you read through the Bible, you become familiar with these things, and you'll be reading in one place, and you'll think, wait a minute, that sounds very familiar. One of the tools that we're blessed with, and have been for a few hundred years as Christians now, is a thing called a concordance. Where you see a word, and you think, wait a minute, I know that, that word. That word comes up a lot. Then you pull out the concordance, and it'll tell you all the Bible verses where that word appears. Just start looking them up. Just start looking up every reference to that word and it's amazing what will happen as your eyes open up to how the word itself uses that word. And in Psalm 118, verses 19 through 21, we'll go slowly through this, it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. Now, gates. See that? Now it changes. It says, This gate. Single of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. The gate is a door. Jesus is the door. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. That's We're talking about Jesus here. But it's prophecy. Psalm 118 was given a thousand years before Jesus was born. And it's telling us about the Messiah to come. And in verses 22 and 23, read that with me. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And Jesus is telling these Pharisees, have you read that? It's in your Bible. See, at the time that Jesus is talking, the book of Mark hadn't been written yet. But He says, haven't you read this? Because the Psalms had been written. And those Pharisees should have known these Psalms. They should have known a lot from the Psalms. They should have re read Psalm 22 and seen where the crucifixion was foretold a thousand years before it happened. It, where in Psalm 22, he, he actually says that, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Exact words that Jesus would say on the cross. In Psalm 22, it says, They pierced my hands and my feet. That's in Psalm 22 foretelling the crucifixion a thousand years. Not only a thousand years before it happened, but in a thousand B.C., they weren't crucifying people. It was not only a prophecy of Jesus being crucified, it was a prophecy of crucifixion itself being used as a method of execution. Folks, that is some book. If you get in there and start studying this thing, it is not a human book. It's the only book that you can have in your library that came from God. And it proves itself over and over. That's why then it closes saying, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And we sing that, and we think it's talking about the fact that it's, you know, oh, look at the sun shines out. <laughs> what a beautiful day. This is the day. You know the song? Yeah. Actually, that is a reference to the day of Jesus coming to die for sins and then the day of Him ruling and reigning as King. 
Because, we're good, just to remind you, on the prophetic clock, Jesus died, was buried and rose again, ascended to heaven, and that began the church age. But prophetically, He comes right back and picks up the 70th week of Daniel where the 69th left off. Prophetically, it's like happening all the, at the same time. And then you open up that prophetic shell and you see this church age in there that the prophets didn't even speak of. That's where we are right now. We're kind of in a Gentile limbo, basically. We're in a parenthesis. And it's about, time is about up. The time of the Gentiles is about up. And that stone that was rejected returns and becomes the head of the corner. But watch this as we go through this. The stone which the builders refused, they rejected and killed. He came into His own, and His own received Him not. But to as many as believe on Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. The stone came and was rejected, and because of that, He's been calling out a people for His own name. And that's us. That's the church, the believers. Now in Psalm 118, 25 and 26, it continues and says, Save now, I beseech Thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech Thee, send now prosperity. You see, now we've gone from Him being rejected and killed to Him coming and bringing the kingdom. And that's why it says, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. See, when Jesus came, and we're going to look at more closely where he comes, and uh, in a future say, where he comes on the foal of an ass into Jerusalem, he's coming in there as king. And he is offering the kingdom. And he's rejected. And on that Palm Sunday that we celebrate, a lot of folks don't get it. They just think, oh, that's the day Jesus came in and they put down a bunch of palms and then they killed Him. <laughs> no, that's the day that the King came in and offered the kingdom, but they rejected Him and killed Him. And of course, the prophecies told us that would happen. Verses 27-28 then say, God is the Lord which hath showed us light Bind the sacrifice with cords. This one who is the king, the stone that was rejected became that sacrifice. Even unto the horns of the altar, Thou art my God. Who? The sacrifice. Thou art my God and I will praise Thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt Thee. God, you remember in Genesis when Abraham was about to slay Isaac? And Isaac says, Papa, where's the sacrifice? Abraham says, God Himself will provide a lamb. But Abraham sacrificed a goat. That's he was speaking of Jesus being the one and only Son. Abraham was offering His only Son, and He was a type of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. God became that sacrifice. God Himself put on human flesh. In your King James Bible, we will remind you that 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. In your new versions, they take that out. That's why we warn you, if you're using the new versions, trip and fall. There's corruption. But in the Bible it says, God, thou art my God, the sacrifice. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, when you think of this, Jesus as the stone who was rejected, then killed, what that means to God the Father? Could this be why God was so disgusted with the idols made by Israel in apostasy? What is Jesus? What are we learning this morning? Jesus is the what? Okay. What did they crucify Him on? A cross. What was a cross made of? Wood. Stone. And wood. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. Let's look at this. 
God the Father sends His only begotten Son, the stone, to be crucified on a tree, the cross, made of wood. And what does Israel do in the years preceding Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 26 through 28? And it begins and says, As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets. Read verse 27 with me. Saying to a stock, that's wood. The very thing that Jesus would be crucified on, Israel is looking at wood. Now read it again. Saying to a stock, thou art my father. And to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. In other words, the stone who would come and die on a piece of wood and Israel in their apostasy is creating false idols out of wood and stone. And looking at that piece of wood and saying, Papa? Father? Looking at a piece of stone and saying, Save us. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I'm just here to tell you the truth. Your Roman Catholic friends are doing that right now. The Orthodox churches are doing that. They have icons and they look at them and they say, Oh, Mother Mary. Oh, St. Michael. And I'm not making fun. I'm telling you the truth. They burn incense. They pray to them and they walk up and they kiss them. You go into their churches, there's worn out spots where they've kissed them so many times they're wearing them out. Think of how sick that makes God. Looking down at people who say they believe in Him and yet taking the very stone and the wood and making graven images. He said not to do it. And it makes Him sick. We're not against Catholic people, Orthodox people, or anybody else. The people, we're against the practice. We're against the idolatry. We're against the apostasy. We're against the error. And just like Jeremiah, if you preach against it, you will be hated because they like their idols. They like their idols. Verse 28, read that with me. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise, if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. In other words, you count out how many cities there were in, in Israel. That's how many false gods made out of wood and stone that they had all over the place and they were worshiping. Calling them Father and God and praying to them. And God says, don't call on me and tell me to save you. You've been worshiping pieces of wood and stone. Call on them. Come on. Have them tell you what to do. Have them save you. Now, why wouldn't God do that? Fair weather Christians? <laughs> call on God when things get rough? I like to call them soap opera Christians. When I was in high school, we watched soap operas. I was not a Christian, um, uh, so I, that, that, it's my excuse. But uh, there was one called Santa Barbara. Anybody remember that? Yeah. And uh, it, we'd, get, we'd come home from, I'd go to a friend's house after school. We actually had a, that was, we first got the, uh, the VCR tapes and they'd record it. Kids, that's a big thing about this big and it's got tape and you stick it in a box. But anyway, uh, we would watch these soap operas and it's funny because they were so godless. I mean, fornicating and lying to each other and backstabbing and killing. And then all of a sudden they get religious. <laughs> oh Lord, please help me. I'm cheating on my husband and I just killed two people. Help me, Lord. And we just crack up watching that. And, and that just planted in my mind. Now, I see people doing that. I just think they're soap opera Christians. <laughs> they just go on along their day without God. But then when things get rough, all of a sudden, Oh, dear Lord, I love you. I haven't talked to you since 1984, but I love you. Please help me. Well, that's what Israel's doing. And just stop for a second. Just think about how insane that is. Jeremiah and Isaiah both talk about it in depth. They take a piece of wood and they carve it and they paint its eyes, put little colors to its coat or whatever it's wearing and then they stick it up on a table and they nail it down so no one will steal it. 
and then they pray to it. I mean, think about that. That's insane. And yet, it's going on all over the world. And I'm not talking about just in third world countries. I mean right here in America. People are doing that. It's big business. Somebody said it was like $7 billion in idol making last year. Huge business. Steve's back there like, hmm, man. <laughs> I could retire on that kind of money. <laughs> now the true stone, Jesus is the true stone. He's not made with hands. We're going to come back and see that in a minute. But it says the true stone would be a snare to those worshipers of false stones. In other words, if you're involved in false religion, it blinds you to the truth. You're involved in false practices, it will blind you to the truth. I know people right now who argue with me and will argue me, with me about yoga and say there's nothing wrong with yoga, it's just stretching. Well then call it stretching and stop calling it yoga. Amen? Amen. I mean if it's just stretching, you're lying when you call it yoga. It's not just stretching, it's yoga. And it is a demonic Hindu practice to prepare you to be filled with a devil. It is to condition your mind and empty your thought processes so that you open yourself up to devils. And if that's not true, then why are so many Christian women, for the most part, I'll tell you this, my experience is mostly women that are getting sucked into this. Why is yoga sucking them out of the churches and into a state of spiritual oblivion? If it's of God, it's just stretching. Why are so many of them quitting churches that preach the truth and going to churches where they know they never hear anything? There's a connection. And those false practices, including yoga or whatever, transcendental meditation and all that stuff, it's a snare. And it blinds you and you will not be able to see the truth. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8. In your Bible, if you're in Jeremiah, it's just a few pages over. Isaiah chapter 8. And this is described in Isaiah chapter 8. And you'll hear of Jesus called a stone of stumbling. He's not purposely making people stumble, but they stumble because of the false stones, the false idols, the false religion. Verses 13 and 14, uh, if you're there, read that with me. Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. Now stop there for just a second. If you don't believe that God uses fear, then you don't believe the Bible. There is this positive onlyism today. It is an imbalanced, psychotic love for all things positive. You have to have negative. If you try to run anything with only a positive charge, it won't run. You need the negative charge, or you're not going to. Even the the phones you're carrying won't work like that. There has to be a positive and negative balance. And God says in Jude, I believe it's Jude 23 and 24, verses 23 and 24, He says, On some have compassion, but on others save with fear. Now if God said that, when everybody else is all only positive, only positive, they are contradicting God. And it says right here, sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself and let Him be your fear and let Him be your dread. If you are in rebellion against God, you have reason to fear. It's just that simple. If you're rejecting the Gospel, you have every reason to fear hell. You have every reason to fear the wrath of God. If you're a Christian and you go into rebellion, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and if you destroy that temple, God will destroy you. Now I know that's not the God being preached on TV and radio and that's why you need to turn that garbage off and get in your Bible and see what the Bible says. The Bible says that if you go in rebellion against God, He will chasten you. He will rebuke you. He will, like a good father, try to bring you back. But the Scripture says if you destroy His temple, He will destroy you. Now, that really most of the time comes down to basically God just taking His hand off of you and letting you self-destruct. I mean, you know, you see somebody who uh, becomes a fornicator, they end up dying of sexually transmitted diseases. They brought it on. 
or uh, drug addicts, you know, and they go off on drugs and end up ODing. God didn't put the pipe in their mouth or stick the needle in their arm. But that's the message. And it says, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. That's Israel and Judah for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Jesus, the stone, becomes a stone of stumbling for those who are in rebellion against God. Now read verse 15 with me. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. That's true in the past, it's true in the present, and it's still going to be true in the future. We, in the past, most of the people who were of Israel rejected the Lord and went into apostasy. Over 2,000 years of Christian history, most of the people who professed Christianity were in rebellion against God. Even today, the majority of professing Christians I know really are in rebellion against God. In the tribulation period, two-thirds of the Jews who are alive during the tribulation will be killed. In the millennium, after a thousand years of peace, it ends with a big, huge rebellion. <laughs> Many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. And that's the stone, Jesus. And this is true of the typical American today. We're not just picking on ancient Israel here. This is as relevant as your newspaper today. You look at what's going on in the world of religion today. And you look at the false gospels being preached. Um, this guy T.D. Jakes, I mean, he's gone off the deep end, man. He's got uh, uh, the crossdresser. What's his name? Uh, Tyler Perry coming up into his church and laying hands on him. And TD's up there doing this because he got a big old check. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And then he had Oprah Winfrey who denies Jesus Christ and says he's not the only way to heaven. And he's hooked up with her now. So it's just going to get worse and worse and worse into apostasy. And your only protection is that book. That's your frontline defense. And in prayer and in fellowship with the saints. Amen. Amen. Now, understanding that Jesus is this stone is also a key to understanding Bible prophecy. Most of the reason why people don't understand Bible prophecy is because they don't get the keys. Uh, turn over to Isaiah 28. And we'll look at that real quick. Isaiah chapter 28. Just a few pages over if you're still in Isaiah 8. And as you see this stone in Bible prophecy, if you understand it's Jesus, it brings things, brings clarity as you're studying. We're going to look at two different places specifically. In Isaiah 28, beginning in verse 16, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone. When God says something three times, you better make note of it. A sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. Now, stare at that long and hard and pray about it. And I believe that is telling you that a Jew who believes in Jesus will not go through the tribulation. There's your nugget. Amen. Read it close. He's laying this foundation stone, precious cornerstone. It's been rejected by the nation. But he that believeth shall not make haste. We'll see in a just... What did Jesus say would happen to the Jews who rejected Jesus? They go into the tribulation and what do they have to do? Flee to the mountains. They will make haste. Amen. Be sure to visit our website at bbfohio.com for links to hundreds of audio and video messages as well as articles, links, and other free resources and a new bookstore being developed offering additional items. This message was brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship. I am Pastor Greg, and we thank you for listening.